back on the faculty associate with the Honda Center for Human Rights and International Justice. I also teach human rights in a number of international law courses over at the law school. We're really pleased to have Professor Matthew Stubbs here with us this quarter as a visiting scholar at the Honda Center. Um, Matt and I have actually worked together on this topic in a way. Um, we're both involved in an experts um, dialogue around creating a manual on military uses of space. Um, it's going to be called the Womera Manual. And if you're familiar with the Tallinn Manual on cyber issues or some of these other expert manuals that have been produced, this will be in that same vein, but will be focused on military uses of outer space. And part of the reason this manual came together and these other expert manuals have happened is that the treaty making process internationally is essentially broken. Um, and the, treaty, uh, the treaties that deal with outer space issues are quite old at this point. In some respects, interestingly, they were quite prescient, and in other respects, they haven't at all anticipated where the field has moved. And so because we aren't in a position to do new treaties, really, just given where geopolitics is, these expert manuals have been quite important. Um, but Matthew has a number of other um, additional areas of expertise, including international human rights, which he'll wed with his space law work in his first talk today, and also domestic constitutional rights. Um, he's at Adelaide, normally at Adelaide Law School, here with us for the quarter. So please join me in welcoming him. We'll be in dialogue for a little bit, and then we'll open it up to questions for the remainder of the time. Over to you. Well, thanks very much, Beth, and um, it's fantastic to be here at Stanford. I want to just thank the Mahanda Center, um, Beth, and Melvin, and, and Jesse, and Steve, and, um, and the, the rest of the team for the opportunity to be here. What I thought I'd do today is basically set out to give you a very brief overview of space law and what the regime of space law is. Uh, and then come to talk about how that might be relevant to human rights uh, and then finish up with a hypothetical exploring how space law and human rights and humanitarian law might all fit together um, in an armed conflict situation. Uh, so that's, that's what's on the agenda. Um, but first, uh, our dear friend Jack Beard at the University of Nebraska has a rule that you can't have any space presentation without a launch video. Um, <laughs> so this is a launch video. This is Space Shuttle Atlantis lifting off. Um, back in the days when we still had the shuttles, and God, do we miss them? Um, then I might just be paging myself in that comment at this point. But um, anyway, so that's the, the launch of the tour. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about space law give you a very brief discussion of some of the issues that seem to me to be important at the moment and areas where the space law that was written 50 years ago isn't necessarily um, obviously guiding what we're doing today uh, and then come to the human rights aspect and obviously try to sell the book because that's what we all do. Um, but it's not my book, it's our book and so we'll, we'll talk about the, the warmer remaining we get to the end. So where do we find space law? Sorry, I've realised I've just stepped out of the camera range. I'm not sorry. Um, where do we find space law? Um, we find it in all sorts of places. One, of course, is customary international law. This is Sputnik, the first artificial satellite to orbit the Earth. And um, what does Sputnik have to do with the law? Well, we didn't know until Sputnik flew um, whether states would take the same approach in outer space as they take in airspace. So in airspace, states have territory, and you can't fly through a state's airspace without permission. Is the same thing going to be true in outer space? No. How do we know? Because Sputnik, because of its orbit, circled over a large number of states in the first few days of its um, mission. Uh, no one objected, therefore it became lawful to circle over people. That's literally how international law works. Um, and it just happens to have happened quickly, uh, because obviously it zooms around very fast. Uh, that's the easy part. What then do you get in terms of a more formal legal regime? You get what is now the body of international space law. It starts with a General Assembly resolution that becomes the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. Now obviously this celebrated its 50th birthday last year. How's it going? Well, in parts it's going well. And one of the reasons it seems to be going well is that it's a principles-based treaty. So it doesn't have a series of minute prescriptions about what the law is going to be. It sets out a series of principles and then hopes that they will be applied in the future. Uh, in part, it's not going well because a lot has changed, of course, in the last 50 years, and so we can't expect perfection in the, in the drafting of this treaty. The Outer Space Treaty is followed by four other space treaties, three of which essentially elaborate on things that are in the first treaty. The Astronaut Agreement, the Viability Convention, Registration Commitment. The last of them is the Moon Agreement, and the Moon Agreement is different 
It's a nice way of putting it, isn't it? Um, the Moon Agreement has a tiny number of states parties, no significant space-faring state as a party to the Moon Agreement, um, for reasons of passing understanding Australia is. Uh, but anyway, one can only uh, do so much with one's own state. Um, something necessary not really to point out on this continent now. Um, so, what happens after that? Well, the Moon Agreement's a disaster, and then, as Beth said, the international treaty-making process is... Defunct is not quite the right word, but almost defunct. States have lost interest in treaties. Um, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, my state has, your state has, a lot of others have too. The answer is we don't like the only things that we can get out of a treaty making process, so it's not worth trying. Um, and the same is true in space. There are lots of things where it would be helpful to have a more detailed legal prescription than what is in the Outer Space Treaty. Um, one of those is the use of force, and I'm going to come back to that later. Um, there is not going to be a treaty on that anytime soon. So where do we then turn to develop the law? Um, one of the areas in which there has been development is called the so-called soft law. So you get things like the UN Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space comes up with the debris mitigation guidelines. <coughs> Those debris mitigation guidelines don't have any formal legal status, but they are now quite influential in guiding the way in which states approach questions of debris. Uh, I'll come and talk about that later. I should say as well, if I say something and you have no idea what the word is that I've said, please stop me, um, because I will get at some point to talking about dual-use objects, and you will all sit there and think, what the hell is a dual-use object? And then I'll remember it has to be a dual-use object, and then you'll think, ah, that's what he's talking about. Um, so when I get to one of those, just kind of point out, otherwise I'll just go on and not realise that you're sitting there thinking, what the hell is this Australian talking about? Um, so there's no solving that, right? I, no matter how much time I spend on this continent, I do not lose any touch of my Australian accent or pick up any single word in uh, the local vernacular. I am stuck with whatever I, whatever I have. Um, so we turn to soft law, and beyond soft law, we turn to non-law entirely. Um, so the Woomera Manual that we're going to get to talking about at the end is simply the view of a group of experts about what they think the law is. Um, and manuals for a variety of reasons come to be influential even though they have no greater status than that. So we'll start out with some of the key principles of the Outer Space Treaty and see how we go from there. These all seem like broad, inoffensive statements and they are. The devil is in the detail. The trick is in applying these to outer space. <coughs> the exploration and use of outer space should be for the benefit and interest of all. Free access, free exploration. All sounds great. We'll come back and talk about one potential glitch there in a minute. Space is not subject to national appropriation. This was an important decision um, that there was not going to be in space the same equivalent of what happened on the face of the Earth. That is, people racing around the globe trying to claim every last square inch of land. Right? And that's over now, right? There's no more land to be discovered. There may be land that comes up, but that will be a separate issue. Um, outer space is not going to be the same. States aren't going to have territory in outer space. Uh, activities in space will be conducted in accordance with international law. This sounds great. It's perfectly sensible. Um, you can't imagine that the alternative would be possible. Um, but it then brings up interesting questions of the sort that I'm going to get to in the end. When you say international law applies in space, how do you then work out which bit? Is it the provision in the international space law? Is it the provision in international humanitarian law dealing with armed conflict? Is it the provision in the human rights treaty that seems to apply here? And so each of those questions then becomes complicated. No station of weapons of mass destruction in outer space. Celestial bodies shall be used exclusively for peaceful purposes. Now, this is where the happy facade of space law starts to fall away, the happy facade of everyone agrees on everything, because this principle is not universally agreed on. For a group of space lawyers and a group of states, peaceful purposes means outer space is entirely for peaceful purposes and you can do nothing beyond it. Uh, for a different group of space lawyers and governments, that's not true. It's not true partly as a historical fact. Most of the exploration in space has been done by military or quasi-military organisations. Right? You can't argue with this fact, this is how it happens. Right? Where does NASA get its pilots from? It gets pilots from the Air Force, effectively, and, and the same is true. So, 
Yeah. It's always been about this. Yes, question. Yeah, I would disagree on that. I'm a biologist. I work with NASA, and Good. a lot of uh, about yes, the black NASA yep. the military is a big area, but there's a lot that's and, and increasingly so. Yes. Yeah, and increasingly so. So yeah, absolutely. So one of the challenges that we're going to talk to in a minute is non-government activity or, or whatever in space. So um, Article Four is challenging. Because if you look at what it says, it says you can't put a weapon of mass destruction in orbit. <coughs> it doesn't say you can't put one through space. Why doesn't it say that? Because the treaty is drafted by the United States and the Soviet Union, and they have a weapon that goes through space. It's an intercontinental ballistic missile. What an ICBM does is it launches is where you get the 12 minutes. Right? You know, the famous 12 minute warning. Launches from Russia, goes up, enters outer space, goes back down, lands. Right? 24 minutes is the calculation. By the time you see it launch, you verify, you work out what's going on, you get the message out, half the time it's gone, it's up here, 12 minutes to get into the sewers or whatever people did in Hawaii last year when they got the fake alert, and that's it. So that's, they were always going to have nuclear weapons in space, um, they're not going to be in orbit though. So that's one of the tricks about the language of this provision. Um, and celestial bodies for peaceful purposes, which is excellent for celestial bodies, but that means anything else, not. Satellites, not covered. So there's some interesting tricks about this. It doesn't apply as neatly as it might look. Uh, asteroids are envoys of mankind, that's good, and the Astronaut Convention fleshes that out further. <coughs> Fair international responsibility um, is on the surface fine. In other talks I give, I can spend an hour talking about the, com the complexities and problems here. I'm not going to do that today, but um, what is meant by responsibility is a problem. Uh, but this was a compromise. The US wanted, of course, to have free enterprise in space. The Soviet Union, of course, wanted not to and to have only government, government activities in space. The compromise, the price at which this is bought, is this article in the treaty that says you can have non-government activities in space, the state is responsible for their activities of their nationals, and the state is responsible for supervision and uh, uh, whatever over the nationals. So that allows non-state actors. And of course, that is now changing in a spectacular way with new space, which I'll come to in a moment. Launching states will be liable for damage. This is fine. There's a liability convention. It applies neatly enough. Um, it's never actually applied because you know, space law is kind of as much a theoretical concept as anything else. It almost applied once. Um, when a satellite disintegrated over Canada and spilled a whole lot of uh, radioactive residue, um, the Canadians had to clean it up. They tried to charge the Russians for it. Um, it didn't actually get resolved under the convention, but the convention structured the way in which the states resolved it ultimately between themselves. So, um, you know, that works. And the basic principle of liability convention is this. There's a dichotomy. In space, damage something else, it's a fault-based liability. If you did something wrong, then you're in trouble. Um, on Earth, it's absolute liability. So a piece of satellite falls through the roof right now and hits me, whoever launched it is liable. It's a very simple kind of way of dealing with it. Uh, states have to abstain jurisdiction and control over objects on their registry, so there's a process of registration. Uh, the process of registration is not uniformly followed, I'm told, um, and there are issues with, for example, if you want to transfer the ownership of a satellite, so there's now a, a protocol to the Cape Town Convention and enabling you to do that in theory. Um, there's no procedure for you, in fact, to transfer registration to a different state, uh, so there are some issues there. Uh, and you have to show due regard for the interests of other states. So this all sounds more or less acceptable. You can quarrel with too many of these. What I want to do now is have talk about some of the pressure points that we see. I'm going to start with a strange question. What is outer space? This, one of the beautiful Hubble photos, is definitely outer space. Uh, the stars in here are definitely in outer space. Um, astronauts up on the sta space station, 400 kilometres above us, are definitely in outer space. Curiously, I can't tell you where you leave national airspace and where you enter outer space. This matters for commercial uses like suborbital space flight. If you want to get on your very expensive flight to space, I had the money to spare, it'd be fun, wouldn't it? Um, are you in space, are you on Earth? Who knows? Here's what we do know. Um, you are probably in space at the point where you are in orbit, where you can go around the Earth once without falling down, effectively. Um, that varies with weather and orbit. On a highly elliptical orbit, it's about 130 kilometres. It's very rough. You're probably in space there. 
Where are you not in space? You're not in space if you're flying a plane. So the point at which aerodynamic controls on an aircraft cease to function is about 80 kilometers. So below that, you're definitely not in outer space, you're in air space. And where does the line lie? Somewhere in the middle. Not only do states not agree on where the line is drawn, but they specifically don't want to agree. It is US policy not to draw the line. Um, other states are more happier to do it. Australia has drawn the line. We have a piece of legislation that says 100 kilometers is it. And it's not wildly wrong and it's fine. There are other states that do that. Um, it's perfectly sensible. Because it doesn't work for the Americans because you have miles. Um, but it's never too late. It's never too late to recant. Um, you can fix it this is. problem. It's yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, 100 is a, a nice solution. There is a kind of an attempt to solve this through physics. The von Kármán line is the, the point at which you have to fly faster than the orbital velocity in order to derive sufficient aerodynamic lift to be in space. Um, traditionally it was said that's 100 kilometers. It's not 100 kilometers. It's a physical thing. It moves. Um, it's probably somewhere between 90 and 100. It may be a touch lower than that. Um, there's some research being done on that at the moment. Um, one of the reasons why states are happy with some constructive ambiguity here is that I don't want to nail everything down. I've learned with past treaties, if you nail everything down, you end up in trouble. Um, this is the lesson of non-proliferation treaties, amongst other things. So they're happy to kind of leave it a bit ambiguous about where you get into outer space. Yeah. So that's one issue. Where does space begin? We don't quite know. But lots of the stuff I'll be talking about today is obviously in space. Here's issue number two, new space. What is this? This is not NASA, this is Jeff Bezos, right? This is Amazon.space or whatever it's called. Um, Blue Origin. Um, the Outer Space Treaty, as I said, envisaged that there would be non-state actors in space. But it didn't, I think, envisage that non-state actors would become the predominant users of space, which is, I think, where we're heading. You can see all of these companies get starting to get interested in getting a piece of the space pie. Um, and that poses a challenge because it, it introduces that extra layer of distance. States who are parties to the treaty make their own arrangements and kind of between themselves. States then have to think about regulating what their nationals are doing in space. To give you an example, earlier this year, the first ever satellites launched without anyone's permission went up. There's a bunch of CubeSats. CubeSat is a satellite roughly <coughs> the size of this water container. Um, launched by an American company that applied for a permit to launch from the US and was denied. They thought, bugger that, they went and paid some Indians to do it and launched it anyway. Um, that is a challenge. Right? That represents people trying to get kind of outside the regime of space law. Um, and it's a challenge we don't necessarily have a perfect solution to. Uh, and of course, the CubeSat, <coughs> God bless it, a cup of water here, um, means that it's a different world in space too. When you traditionally think about space, launches and kind of Australia used to have legislation about space launches that has just changed. You were thinking about something the size of a car effectively um, that you would put up into space at enormous phenomenal cost to do something like provide satellite TV or phone communications. And the big boys would play this game. Right? This was a game for AT&T and kind of the very big communications companies. Um, it's no longer just that. So a CubeSat doesn't necessarily cost that much to make or launch. Um, I should at the start have acknowledged there are a number of people here, probably the majority of people here, are members of the Stanford Student Space Initiative. Um, if you don't know anything about um, SSI, then Google it. It is the largest project-based student organization on campus. Um, they don't do a huge bunch of law stuff because they are basically a bunch of engineers that have kind of grew, but they do so much cool stuff. Right? They have high altitude balloons, they have rockets, they've got a satellite CubeSat in space at the moment doing some, what is it, it's a, a laser communication experiment with JPL. Um, so kind of this amazing things being done here. Um, and so you know, here is a great example of what's going on. That a bunch of students, a student organisation at Stanford, I mean no offence, but it's just a student organisation at Stanford, has a satellite. Right? It's up there, it's doing things right now. <coughs> is an example of the way in which the world has changed. Um, and it, it's kind of, it's almost funny. I was doing some work with the Australian government last year. They wanted some advice about the, the, the little cloud of CubeSats they were putting up. I said, how are you launching it? 
They said, oh, we phoned our mate at NASA and said, when you've got some space on a rocket, they said, oh, look, a couple of months will be right. Um, so he sent it up to the space station and threw it out the window. <laughs> that's, I mean, it's a slightly scientific version of that, but they basically put it on the space station, throw it out the window, and off you go. That's how you launch this out um, And that's why universities can get into it. That's why you're going to get all these sorts of things. It's tremendously powerful, right? A huge cloud of CubeSats can deliver internet to the whole world, is the theory. Um, but it raises all sorts of questions. Um, so I'm going to come to one of those now. I will just briefly talk about space mining, because it's kind of fun, right? Um, and because it used to sound ridiculous and shouldn't sound ridiculous anymore. Plans for resources might be going broke, um, but we'll kind of put that to one side for now, because there are businesses that aren't. Why is space mining an issue? Because it challenges two of the fundamental things in the space treaty that we talked about at the start. I'll tell you what they are in a minute. Let me tell you first what space mining is and isn't. Space mining is probably not going up to outer space, finding a huge amount of platinum and bringing it back to the Earth, reducing the value of my wedding ring. Um, <laughs> it's possible, but probably not the first thing to do. The market is not to bring it back to Earth. Uh, getting things out of Earth's orbit and back into Earth, incredibly costly, incredibly inefficient, um, huge amounts of energy required, you wouldn't bother. What you want is to use it there. So what planetary and others are planning to do, it's quite simple. Find an asteroid that has water on it, get the water out, convert it into hydrogen, that's fuel. Stage one. What do you then do? You then wait for someone who wants to go to Mars. And someone who wants to go to Mars can't very easily, or possibly can't at all, get out of Earth's orbit, get out of Earth's gravity, without kind of spending up so much fuel that they won't have any left for the rest of the mission. So what do you do? You send them off with as much fuel as they need to get into orbit, as much fuel as you launch the space shuttle with. When you get up there, you go and you buy your fuel from the gas station, which happens to have been established on an asteroid by planetary or whoever it is. It's a fabulous business model. People are launching satellites right now to look at asteroids, not just the NASA one that found this asteroid the other day. Private enterprise are launching satellites right now this year to go and look at space objects and see has this got water in it, could we mine it. Um, so that's what's going on. What's the problem? Two problems from the outer space treaty. I said to you before, no national appropriation, free access to celestial bodies. And that all sounded good. What's the problem? How does mining work? These are finite resources in the same way that the Earth's finite resources have been expertly managed and used over the last 200 years. Um, the problem is, mining works basically in one way. Mining works today exactly the same way it worked in 1849 when the people arrived here in California because of the gold rush. You go up, you find yourself a little space of ground, you stake your claim, you get a license. The license says you're the only one that can dig there. In exchange, you get anything you find, but you give us royalties. None of that infrastructure that makes mining possible works in space. Planetary's business plan and every other space mining business plan as of this minute is we hope to get there and get what we need before anyone else can beat us to it. There's nothing otherwise to stop it. Is it appropriation of outer space to go there, pinch all the finite resources and bugger off with them? That's the question. Um, and there are views on both sides. The prominent view, the view the US Congress has adopted is that it's not. It's appropriation if you claim ownership of the body. So the famous photo of Neil Armstrong with the flag on the moon is accompanied by an express US government disclaimer saying we don't claim ownership of the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Did you not? Right? So that's one thing. But what about if you go there, you pinch all the resources and leave half of the, what's left and then just go away from it? Um, it's not immediately clear. Some states have kind of acquiesced in this, some states have objected. The US and Luxembourg have gone ahead and said we're going to do it. Congress, beautifully, said we don't think we're violating the law by doing this. <laughs> it makes it a bit hard to understand exactly what they mean uh, by that provision in the US code, but anyway. Uh, so this is a challenge. <coughs> Free access is also a challenge, because if you think about it, once you find the thing and you want to dig it out, you don't want to start digging it out here and find someone else comes 200 metres across and starts digging it out from there. <coughs> uh, that's what mining legislation prevents, and <laughs> kind of terrestrially, there's no approval in that space. So this is an area where the law is not up with what's going to happen. The law is clearly not fit for purpose. Now we turn to debris. 
Um, there are many, many topics that we could talk about that I'm skimming through here. Debris and traffic management are sort of related. I'm going to kind of roll them in together. Traffic management is the same thing as you have in air traffic. Uh, tonight I have to get on an aircraft and fly somewhere to give another talk tomorrow. Um, when I do that, I will be relying on the rules of air traffic management and air traffic control in getting me there. So the last, the absolute last resort, keeping me safe tonight, is the plane's electronic thing, the TCAS warning that says you're about to crash into something, and the pilot's looking out the window. But that's the absolute last resort. Before we get there, are a whole bunch of things, including agreements on where the flight path is, published routes that aircraft take, and air traffic control. So when I fly up to Seattle tonight, I'll be relying on all of that, and the way in which I get there and know that nothing is going to hit me on the way is very heavily prescribed. There's a chart that the pilots follow that says you will take off, you will go in this direction, you will go to this altitude. Air traffic control will then route them through waypoints on a, on a routing and then get me to Seattle. Nothing equivalent to that exists in space. What we know is that there's 30,000 objects we're tracking fly, floating around in space. Right? Some of them small, maybe. <coughs> Um, some of them big, some of them currently used, some not. So traffic management is one thing, and the other thing is debris. Because as it gets more and more congested, the risk of things crashing increases. And when we say things crashing, so we're not talking a fender bender, this stuff is moving at phenomenal speed. So two things crash together, you can generate vast amounts of debris. This is a dramatization of something that happened in 2007. Chinese had a defunct weather satellite, and they had a space weapon, an anti-satellite weapon. It's an Earth-based weapon that goes up and blows up a satellite. It's not that fancy in weaponry terms. Right? The US has got one and has done it. China's got one and has done it. The Russians have got one. Most states could modify a warship missile pretty easily to do this. Right? It's not fancy technology. Um, but what happens is the problem. So this video is going to start out and you'll see one little red dot come down from the top and then you'll see it get blown up. <laughs> Here, into all of those. Because once it gets blown up, it creates all these bits of debris <laughs> travelling at different speeds. Different speeds means different orbits and it starts to spread out. So you can see within hours of this thing being blown up, you can see this huge kind of cloud of debris floating around up there. And what you'll see in a minute, this video is space station focused, but don't kind of worry too much about that, is that this cloud of debris starts to circle the Earth. And it means that the space station has several times had to be moved out of the way of this debris. Moving a satellite isn't costless. Right? Moving a satellite consumes fuel which reduces the lifespan of the satellite because you can't read fuel. Um, so here you go, you get this debris, and now we're going to add in known satellites, and then we're going to add in other debris that's currently in orbit. And what you see is a very busy place. This is LEO, low Earth orbit, right? And LEO is full of all of this stuff. The risk of collision becomes a problem. Risk of collision becomes a problem because of a thing called the Kessler Syndrome. I'm trying to explain science. I'm not a scientist. I don't understand anything about science. If I was smart enough, I would have done that rather than law, right? Um, but anyway, the Kessler Syndrome basically says the more and more stuff you get in outer space, you increase the risk of collision. Once you increase the risk of collision enough, you make one collision inevitable. That increases the amount of debris. You have an exponential response, which eventually gets you to the point where outer space is one great debris field surrounding the Earth. <coughs> and at that point, you can't use it anymore. Mm. So everything we rely on satellites for, right, the map on my phone that told me how to get here, um, the ATM that I take out you know, money for, good night. All right, forget it. Um, so that's the problem with debris. Now, we're not there yet. But every time you have the equivalent of the Chinese um, ASAT test, that's the risk. That's the problem with blowing up satellites in orbit. You're creating this debris. 
So what's the solution? The solution is partly these space debris mitigation guidelines that come out of Golf Wars, that come in here on the piece of use of outer space. And they say, avoid destroying stuff. <laughs> it sounds simple, but remember, we don't have to be talking about deliberate. We could be talking accidental. So let's say your Iridium owns the constellation of satellites that provide satellite phones around the world. You get every day from the US tracking thing an email or a message that says, here are the objects that we think might cl pass close to your satellite today. And you decide, is the risk big enough to move? Is the risk of hitting this thing big enough that I'm going to expend fuel and reduce the lifespan of my incredibly expensive satellite to avoid the risk? And you get it right most of the time and it's fine. And then one day you don't. A number of years ago, Iridium got the message and said, we'll wear the risk. <coughs> the risk materialised. The front Russian satellite hit it, took out the Iridium satellite. It cost phenomenal amounts of money and created a huge free field not through any kind of deliberate <coughs> nastiness. Right? This was a defunct satellite that no one had control over. It was known about, they took the risk, and you end up with this bunch of debris. Um, so you avoid this. If you have to break something up, do it at high altitude. Right? The ways of avoiding debris are don't create it. Now, launches create debris. Right? There's kind of no way around that that's going to happen. Um, but most of it's low. Um, you want to blow something up, blow it up nice and low. When the US did the equivalent of the Chinese thing, they blew their thing up. It wasn't quite the equivalent, but it's basically the same thing. They blew their thing up much lower, and most of the fragments re-entered within about a week. Right? So there's a way of doing it. The Chinese blew it up at 800 kilometers, roughly, um, creating you know, debris that will be there for 100, 200 years or whatever, before it re-enters. Because stuff when it re-enters will basically burn up in the atmosphere and no harm, no foul. He says that confidently. There are satellites powered by kind of nasty fuel for whom that is not true. Um, but in general terms, it's no harm, no foul. They can get it to burn up in the atmosphere. Alternatively, you can kind of move it into a so-called graveyard orbit and kind of hope that it'll stay there forever. Um, so this is all fine, but there's a couple of things that are going to lead us into the nasty military blowing up the world, which is where we're heading in this talk. Um, the first is uh, this. State, space objects, once they get up there, are on the registry of the state. And you need that state's permission to do something with them. So you want to solve the space junk problem. Right? The piece of space junk you want to capture comes from where? Right? You have to find that out and find out who it belongs to and get their permission to do it under current international law. It's going to have to change, but that's how it is. So it's hard to do that. And then there's the problem. We'll see if my little YouTube video works. This is September this year. This thing is a little fake satellite launch from the International Space Station, and this thing that looks like Spider-Man is in space is a net to capture it. And you see the little spinning satellite get captured by the net beautifully. Right? This is how you get rid of space debris. All right? This is one way of getting rid of space debris. The Europeans have come up with this. What's the problem? The problem is really, really, really simple. If you can use it to capture space debris, you can use it to capture a live satellite. Right? Every technology in space almost is dual use. If you can develop a way of refueling a satellite by approaching close up to it and refueling, you can do exactly the same thing to approach close up to it and blow glue over its sensors. Um, anything that you can do to a satellite that is harmless can be turned into something that is harmful. Hence the prevention of an arms race down space. On the subject of kind of UN resolutions and things perennially. There's a bunch of Paros resolutions. This is the most recent from last year's General Assembly session. General Assembly urges all member states to contribute actively to the goal of preventing an arms race in outer space as an essential condition for the promotion of international cooperation. Alright, so a few things here. Um, People worry about Donald Trump's Space Force. A Space Force is nothing more than getting a bunch of people already doing this in disparate agencies and putting them together. So you can forget about the Space Force kind of being a huge problem. But let's just talk about the disparate agencies for a minute. 
Um, people say we don't want to have an outer spa space war. Too late. First space war was 1991. Uh, Gulf War relies heavily on the navigation that you get from the GPS um, in order for its smart missiles to work. Right? America won so easily in 1991 because it had fantastic precision guided weapons. The fantastic precision guided weapons predominantly depend on space assets for the precision. Right? So we're already in space wars. What we haven't had is a state respond in space. And that's the, the kind of the hypothetical that I'm getting to. What state's doing about this? Well, the Chinese and Russians have a draft treaty, the PPWT. It's a lovely document. It looks like all draft treaties do. It would be excellent. Um, like all treaties drafted for strategic purposes, it bans all of the things that they think the Americans are good at, and it doesn't ban any of the things they think they're themselves good at. Right, we've been around this block before. I'm not going to talk about disarmament, but we know that kind of disarmament hasn't been a great success even before Donald Trump tries to pull out of a few of the more successful treaties. Um, but that's a topic for another day as well. Um, <coughs> So there's a treaty which is never going to be agreed to by the US or a bunch of our allies. <coughs> there's a European initiative which comes out originally out of a US NGO called the International Code of Conduct. Uh, that's also not really going anywhere. <coughs> so what do you do when you're not going anywhere? You make your own rules. <laughs> um, this is the Woomera Manual. Woomera is a place in South Australia um, where Australia launched and became the world's fourth space-faring nation when we launched a satellite. This is the satellite. Um, since then, of course, we kind of fell off the uh, list of major space-faring players, but anyway, we're there for a moment. Um, a Woomera in uh, Aboriginal language, not the Aboriginal language where Woomera is, curiously, um, is a spear-throwing implement, so it's a nice metaphor. Um, the Woomera Manual is a book, uh, I'm selling my book now, so Bring the slide um, the War Manual is a book that 20 people are writing about what we think the law is on military activities in space. Beth and I happen to be two of them. Um, we have academics from a variety of countries. We have some government representatives from a variety of countries as well. Why are we doing it? Because states aren't going to. So we think that it's worth um, getting into this. But I'm going to now turn to human rights, because otherwise you'll think, what on earth am I doing monopolising the Honda Centre's <laughs> presentation for this thing about space law? Um, and talk about how human rights apply and then get to the scenario that I'll leave you with. Um, there's a potential problem for human rights. The human rights treaties also say states have to do particular things to individuals within their jurisdiction. And we know that you can't have territory in outer space. So how are human rights got obligations going to apply in outer space? Well, thankfully, we now accept that the human rights obligations can apply extraterritorially as well. So the same law that makes human rights applicable in occupied Palestine, for example, um, is the same law that makes them applicable in outer space. Um, occupied Palestine is the one context in which there's still some disagreement about whether human rights apply, but we're going to pretend that there isn't. Um, we're going to say most people seem to now accept and most states seem to now accept extraterritorial application. The test is effective control, and in some of the situations that you can think about in space, that's easily met. So human rights are going to apply, then the question is how. And this is where we get to our regime interaction. So because I want to make it complicated and because this is kind of a thing, right, you can envisage any number of ways in which we might get into a space conflict. Um, if we do, here's an example. State A has a satellite, right? Nothing fancy. Bog standard satellite, it's up there, it's a dual use satellite. You can see that it provides positioning information to the armed forces so they know where they are, so they know where the other side is, so it guides weapons and so on. Um, it does a bunch of other stuff for civilians, including HADR. So it's a bog standard scenario. All right, state B is at war with state A and has a weapon, as lots of states do, that could blow up the satellite. Can they? That's the question, there's nothing complicated about this. It's a standard IHL question, IHL International Humanitarian Law, Law of Unconflict. Um, standard IHL question, and you run the standard tests. Kind of what's it going, who's it going to kill, what's going to happen, etc. And we'll run them in a minute. The only trick is that happens in space. So we're talking about the consequences for humans on the ground of an activity in space. It is possible to talk about human rights consequences in outer space itself. It's just less exciting because it's not going to happen tomorrow. Whereas 
the on the ground thing came. So we're talking about what happens on the ground and what happens to the outer space environment if you create a bunch of debris. So what's the law? This is going to be too small for you to read. I'm sorry, I should have perhaps split it up. But um, space law. Article 4 of the treaty. No weapons of mass destruction in orbit. Celestial bodies for peaceful purposes. Okay, but that's not actually applicable in our context. We're talking about a satellite. Uh, avoid harmful contamination. Yeah, we're going to come back and talk to that. We run the IHL rules. This is standard targeting, right? Distinction. Is this an object through by means of which its like nature, location, purpose, or use makes an effective contribution to military action and whose destruction would confer a military advantage? Answer yes. It's providing positioning information to the to the military that makes them more effective and helps them to beat the other side. Yes, there's a military advantage. Proportionality is the incidental loss to civilians excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated. This, of course, is always factual, um, but it's not hard to imagine that it might be. Satellites are so useful. Satellites are the difference between the Gulf War of 1991 and the Vietnam War. You want kind of a very crude analogy. It doesn't entirely work, but it works a bit. Um, so. Could there be a huge military advantage from destroying a satellite? Yes. Um, could you do that theoretically without necessarily doing all that much to civilians on Earth? Possibly. Maybe you inconvenience a few, maybe you kill a few. Um, but hey, that's what collateral damage is. Uh, so you can envisage that you might get over distinction and proportionality pretty easily. Now, at this point, it's not sounding potentially all that comforting. But don't worry, because here comes something that is. Precautions. All feasible precautions in the choice of means and methods to minimise or avoid civilian loss or damage. Now, in a space situation, this is almost always going to mean that something else is your first port of call. Because the damage of blowing up a satellite in orbit is always going to be significant. And if you have alternatives, you'll use them. What's the alternative? You attack the ground control station. You have a cyber attack. You jam the signal coming from the satellite or going to the satellite. Any number of ways in which you can target a satellite other than by an ASAT, that is a, a weapon. So you could envisage that this is in fact where we start to see kind of the nightmare scenario rolls back. Um, precautions we've done. Environment. Additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions has this thing that's deliberately a very high threshold which is you can't, um, or you should take care to protect the national environment against widespread long-term and severe damage. It's deliberately a very high standard. Um, the Americans were fairly keen on that amongst others, and you can probably imagine why if you realise this treaty came in 1977. Um, but I'll leave you to draw that particular connection. So that's IHL, and it might be a bit comforting. Can human rights law comfort us anymore? Is there anything we might get out of human rights law? I'm just going to look at the right to life here because, um, and I promise I'm winding up soon, um, right to life because that's kind of the, the obvious example here. No one should be arbitrarily deprived of their life, says Article 6 of the ICCPR, that's fine. We know that if a state's not a party to the second additional protocol, that means you can still have the death penalty because it's not arbitrary, or at least so the argument goes. Um, there will be plenty of people who might dispute that, including me. Uh, what are the requirements? has to be absolutely necessary to kill them, uh, has to be strictly proportionate, you have to take precautions, and you have to have an effective ex post facto investigation. Now, how might all of this fit together in our happy little satellite scenario? Number one, I don't think that we're going to displace the military necessity rules of IHL by kind of some European jurisprudence on human rights. I think that's probably not going to happen. Uh, so we might just say IHL is going to trump that one. Proportionality. There are some differences here, and I think one of the interesting questions, all I'm doing is asking questions, right? I don't have the solutions to this. Um, we'll see if in our book, once we write it, um, states start to do what we actually suggest they should do, and then that might become the law, in which case we'll be very happy. Uh, but let's not get our, ahead of ourselves too far. Um, human rights probably take some things into account in proportionality reasoning that human, humanitarian law doesn't. So it might be that you could see a different way of approaching the proportionality analysis out of that. 
In precautions, they both seem to be singing from the same hymn sheet. Uh, there's some complementarity there. Investigation's a nice one. Um, is there any reason you couldn't imagine some requirement of an effective ex post facto investigation applying in this context just because it's in outer space? No. And that's effectively what happened in Alskany. Uh, Alskany is one of the cases about the um, British soldiers in Iraq in 2003 and thereafter. Um, and it's where um, they said in the case of five deaths, um, there was not a sufficient investigation into why these deaths occurred and whether they were lawful or otherwise. So you can see that will come in. So human rights here might have helped in our proportionality assessment. It might help in requiring some sort of follow-up investigation, which doesn't get much of a run in humanitarian law, although it's there a little bit. And then space law. What, I, what am I giving space law credit for here? I'm hoping space law can save the environment of space. It's not an unreasonable expectation. And I'm hoping it can do that by lowering the bar. Harmful contamination is the standard in space law. It's probably significantly less than widespread long-term and severe damage. Um, and I'm hopeful that space law there is going to come in and say, okay, because of the unique environment of space, because of the inherent debris risks of flying up satellites, this is something we have to take into account that is different from the way in which you'd approach it under IHL, which is to say, yeah, it's bad, but it's not that bad. Um, so that's, that's kind of the speculation about how this might all work. Regime interaction in international law is a perennial topic, and it's not going to be resolved anytime soon, but this is just one way in which human rights comes into play in the outer space context in a military setting. Um, obviously, if you want to know how this plays out by the book, it'll be out in a couple of years' time. Um, apart from that, thank you, and I look forward to some questions and discussion. Thank you.